Being a CISO is like waging a never-ending chess game against players you don't know, can't see, and attack without warning. On this podcast, cybersecurity experts have a pragmatic dialogue on cyber risk, current attacks, and security trends. Welcome to the CISO's Gambit. I'm joined by Suva Sinha, CISO in residence at Zscaler. Suva is a 25-year industry veteran and previously CISO of leading high-tech multinationals. Suva has developed and led information security and risk programs across engineering, manufacturing, and software organizations. His experience includes IT resilience, operating technology security, identity transformation, and ransomware preparedness and response. Suva, welcome to the CISO's Gambit. It's wonderful to be here with you today. Thank you, Sean. Thank you for the invite. It's a privilege. So for our audience, would it be possible for you to provide a quick overview of what brought you to Zscaler and the story that got you to uh, make this transition from where you were in your last role? Thank you. I mean, it's, it's, it has been a journey, I can tell you that. So right before Zscaler, I was the CISO of a semiconductor company called NXP Semiconductors. It's a fairly large-ish multinational semiconductor company uh, with a strong presence in automotive and security solutions. And um, before that, I was with Microsoft as the senior director for digital security and risk engineering. So over my career, I have played leadership roles in large security operations teams. In Bank of America, we I had a team of 200 plus, veritable army. And then I wanted to get deeper on into the engineering side of things and the Microsoft opportunity came up. And for almost nine years, I was in Microsoft on the engineering side. And then I moved to NXP to become their CISO. And one of the things that I always kept thinking about is what next? And um, it was around that time that uh, I had just left NXP and I was exploring opportunities and Zscaler uh, approached me to look at this CISO in residence role. And I said, yes, that is different, right? That is interesting. I can do what I am passionate about, but I can do it in a slightly different capacity. I can help my peers, I can help the industry, Um, I can have a more visible public presence, which was something that is good for my ego. (laughs) (laughs) You said the quiet part out loud. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, It it is what it is, right? I mean, and I... And it, 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 in fact, um, it's, it's an advice I give to all the people whom I mentor that you, as you move in different stages of your career, you have to ask yourself the honest question, what do you really want? And have that conversation with your mentors and your manager and see how you get there. Yeah. And uh, operational security leadership roles is a life in crisis. It's a 24-7 crisis manager's role, as you know, Sean. So um, as much as I love the love to hear my own voice, an operational security leadership role does not give that. Right? And then I said, bingo, this is a God-given opportunity. Let's take it and let's see where it takes me next. So I am here in this, with this awesome team, very dynamic company, uh, something exciting happens every day. I love meeting customers. Uh, yeah, it's 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 been a great beginning, and I'm very very happy I made that choice. When you were making this transition in the early 2000s to the early 2010s from a large multinational bank into that time that you went to a large software manufacturer, what did you find at that point of your career? were the new lessons that you learned, things that perhaps you hadn't anticipated, not that you weren't already accustomed to massive scale, but a slightly different approach towards the problem that you had to adjust for 
personally or career-wise? Great question, Sean. And I would say there are two parts to that answer. So the first part is, again, an honest introspection of what is it that I know nothing about? Right? What is it that I would love to learn given an opportunity? And then seeing, you know, like, where is that opportunity? And at that point of time, when I was in Bank of America for almost a decade, I had realized or I felt I have realized that large security problems can only be solved through engineered solutions. You cannot throw more people into it, build up larger operational teams and hope to solve it effectively. And uh, then I realized that my, my, my exposure to security engineering is very, very weak. And, um, and that led me to the jump. The other part also is that you do need supportive organizations and mentors and managers who is willing to take that bet on you to say that he may not have done this before in exactly the same way. But he has the passion, he has the drive, he recognizes the problem, and he can do it. And I think it's a combination of both. You need both. Um, yeah, and, and of course, when I joined Microsoft, learning the nitty gritties of how engineering happens was extremely complex. Uh, it, it, it was a daily struggle. But I what did you find to be that that struggle? Was it the shift in the differences in the engineering responsibilities, or was it something? It, it's it. So how security engineering happens in a software company is very different from how security operations is run in a large financial institution. At least it was then. Like now banks have also become very very engineering focused, but. Um, that's how it was then. So it was the approach was different. Some of the skills that you needed to get your job done was different. And uh, I had to be honest with my team to let them know that I know that all of them know a lot better than me and more than me about what needs to be done. And I shared with them that I want to learn and I want to help you. So let's, let's, let's do it. And that, that, I feel that candor and honesty worked out. Um, again, from Microsoft to when I joined NXP um, to become the head of cybersecurity and then got promoted to CISO. It was pretty much the same thing. I wanted an experience in executive leadership in cybersecurity. And I mean, what does it mean to do executive presentations. Right? I mean, what does it mean to interact with the board? What is that mind shift? How do you think differently when you frame a program for a large enterprise? And uh, that led me to that shift. So in each each inflection point in my career, it has been a, it has been a different a different need, a different desire, and a different kind of opportunity for myself. When you when you transitioned into your CISO role, obviously there's large changes. I remember my first time <laughs> and learning very hard lessons often very quickly. One thing that sticks out to me is moving from very large scale operational roles with heavy engineering function and also now moving into another large scale role supporting a heavy infra engineering function. Did you find that the skills that you had developed on the technical and operational side translated well because semiconductors, while adjacent to software, they are different animals. They were and they were not. Uh, let me explain. Um, they were different industries, but the way I look at it, the 
fundamentals of cybersecurity do not change that much. Uh, if you think of it to its, if you decompose it to its first principles, you need to have the right people with the right skills for the problem that you need to solve. You need to have the right processes that need to solve it. Right? And then what is the technology that you need? Because an uh, engineering organization, to an engineering organization, every problem looks like an engineering problem to solve. Right? You build for it. To a large enterprise, you have to operate under extremely hard financial constraints. You have to decide between build or buy. You have to prioritize. So it, you look at it very, very differently. And uh, again, another level deeper, it, you have to think about securing identities. You have to think of securing endpoints. You have to think of securing services. And you have to bring a lot of these basic things together in the industrial context, right, of your, of your context. So, yes, semiconductor was a different industry, but um, there are many, many skills that um, were transferable, that translated pretty easily. So you mentioned the, the transition and the cross-pollination of skills. I have a, a friend of mine that is in the process of considering moving into a heavy manufacturing organization. And they had asked me, what were the fundamental differences? Now, my background only having advised manufacturing companies, not having to be fully accountable for a manufacturing organization. I advise them as much as I could based upon my uh, fairly limited experience in that area uh, compared to somebody like yourself. And one of the things that uh, I had struggled to explain were those more nuanced differences. So obviously the big ticket items like identity, <coughs> authentication, the complexities of, of securing aspects of the network uh, for transport, those appear to be fairly the same. However, what I'm interested in learning from you is in today's context as you're advising and, and looking at manufacturing, especially these large scale, very complex manufacturing businesses such as the former company you were with, what have you found to be the thing that gets overlooked the most often when you're dealing with operational technology or IoT-like technology, taking the traditional IoT, for example, connected devices such as smart devices, but the more nuts and bolts, what are things that you found to be gaps? I would say that the biggest gap and the lesson that we learned is that Often enterprises and cybersecurity teams within enterprises start from a point of view that we don't really understand manufacturing technologies, so let's leave that out of scope for the time being. And let's solve for everything else, and we'll come back and solve it later, which never gets done. And um, yeah, and, and often legacy environments are flat networks. And in a super flat network where everybody is an equal citizen, the weakest link of the chain is what will bring you down. And having manufacturing environments exactly makes that happen. So you have a very, very weak link exactly where your factories are. And now, and hackers know that well, right? So hackers know that manufacturing operations tend to be the soft underbelly of many modern enterprises. And they have been, you know, compromising manufacturing environments extensively over the past two, three years, especially past two years. 
and as a hacker, you know the pain you can cause because any compromise of the manufacturing environment is does not affect just that factory. It will affect your MRP runs, right? The manufacturing resource planning runs. It will affect your inventorying. It will affect your just-in-time inventory. It will affect your promised deliveries out of the factory. It will affect the entire supply chain end-to-end. And often it will affect your customers as well. Um, Recently, there was a large automotive manufacturer which had to shut down deliveries because one of their suppliers got compromised. So you are part of a large chain. So that's, that's the complex part. So you cannot ignore it. You have to solve it. Now, how do you solve it is the question. And um, that is where, again, to me at least, we, the realization is that the fundamentals come back. You have to ask yourself, what do I know? Right? What are the identities? What are the devices? And how do I secure it? And then once you decompose it to the basic zero trust principles, you start getting a sense of the problems because it is an adaptive problem. You don't even know the scale of the problem before you start solving it. And as you solve it, the problem goes bigger and bigger and bigger. So you you have to take that approach. So historically, the traditional way to do it was that you segregate each factory, maybe behind a firewall. Then you segment inside the factory, but no factory is a pure play factory, right? You'll have office, you have distribution, you have warehouses, all within the same premises. Um, And then you have to micro segment within the factory floor, right? And then R just is the five machines lying side by side one segment because they are spatially in one place or is one machine in first floor, one machine in second floor or three machines on three different parts of the factory part of the same logical chain. And that's how I, you segment it. These are not trivial questions. You have to do it in partnership with the factory. And even after you have done this mammoth gargantuan exercise and spent millions of dollars doing it, you realize it is all redundant right? because so many exceptions have been given, so many emergency changes have happened that you have this complex infrastructure with a gazillion exceptions, which is already out of date. And you're back to the drawing board. Right? So this is the classic conundrum of factory security. And um, then you say, you know, how, how the hell do you do it? Then, and of course, there are uh, what often gets ignored are the operational parts of it, right? I mean, you set up a kill switch. Who will, who will press the kill switch? Factory management think it is you in cybersecurity. You are sitting 5,000 kilometers away. You don't have a hell of a clue what's happening when shit breaks loose you know, in, in the factory. And, and again, I mean, these are the operational things that bring down a perfectly good plan on paper. But I think luckily with uh, the kind of solutions that Zscaler now has right, with their app. There is a better way. I mean, I wish we had some of those, you know, like many of my manufacturing partners had some of these over the years. But it's a much more elegant solution because now it, you, it gives you an opportunity to do micro segmentation at the asset level. It lets you track east west traffic. Um, so it, it, it's, it's made life so for our customers who would be down that journey today, it will make life a hell lot simpler because the complexities of the traditional architecture, um, in, including its redundancies and failovers and all of that. I mean, it, it's, it's too expensive and too complex. You'd mentioned earlier that one ongoing or one massive change or problem or breach 
somewhere within the supply chain has cascading effects and this has been seen over and over again not just in manufacturing how when doing risk modeling in that particular area how have manufacturing processes that are really focused on ma failure mode analysis and i'm talking about the six sigmas of the world those types of or tqm type models in your experience have you seen those be applied with any efficacy to the cybersecurity problem so for example i've done decomposition analysis in the past utilizing uh, six sigma's cypoc model you know the sipoc model and i've always found that to be very helpful for enumeration and then taking that as an input into a risk model not necessarily becoming the risk model but it is a portion of it have you observed in your time both as an engineering leader as a cybersecurity leader a successful deployment or recasting of other models like TQM or Six Sigma work successfully in cybersecurity? I have seen it, let's say, more successfully applied on the operational technology side than in the classic cybersecurity side. Um, cybersecurity, if I would say pure play software technology as an industry is not very statistically savvy. That is my experience. Right. And even when I was in Microsoft, I remember Satya Nadella used to say that one of the muscles we must develop as an organization is statistical acumen. And you mean uh, statistical analysis and collection? That or is it analysis, you know, the way you analyze, the way you express your insights. I mean, either it's something you throw on the wall and looks like a pattern, or you say it is based on a statistical, rigorous statistical technique. Right? There is a difference. So, um, however, on the operation side and operational technology side, the world is a lot more mature when it comes to applying Six Sigma, Lean, Cypoc type techniques, because that is done in a regular course of event for any factory defect analysis, for example. So applying it to cybersecurity is the people find it a lot easier. So this is where people and culture comes in. And we have applied in, in the factory setting. And, um, and that that's what typically organizations do to, at least I have known organizations to use it reasonably effectively. And that is what helps them take the abstracted view that I have done this failure mode analysis. And I think, and I know there are automotive companies who have said that, you know, I want an architecture that will let a compromised factory be isolated, but my operation to run uninterrupted for 48 hours. And cybersecurity team, you have 48 hours to do recovery and restoration in collaboration with the factory management. Interesting. Just so I'm clear, are you saying that as one of these modalities or scenario, probably better said, there's a desire to effectively have in a breach scenario, continuing operations in an impacted manufacturing location, even though they might be fully compromised? Is that what I heard you say? Or the rest of the enterprise manages its operation even though one factory is fully offline, right? So you have five, you are an automotive factory or a semiconductor factory, you have five factories and one of the four is offline. How will you run for 48 hours with that part of your operation completely segregated from the network? And how would you manage, right? I, for some, it is 48 hours. I know others for which it is 72 hours. So, but it's, it is a timeline that you define that this is my tolerance of threshold of pain. And if I can't do it within that time, then I mean, there will be larger impact, but I will, I will structure my operations. I will structure my processes. I will train my people in a way that I can run for 72 hours or 48 hours with one site 
completely cut off by the kill switch because that has been compromised. So the so the concept of assume breach it has sort of started seeping into large manufacturing organizations already. And it has started getting adopted in a way that is meaningful and relevant to them in a construct that they understand. And what I think is that more and more organizations have to go down that path of zero trust design on one side, but also an assume breach mindset and marry the two. In manufacturing, when taking a assume breach mentality, how does one build a team around that assumption? For example, are you staffing at a level that would be necessary for an incident, effectively the way you would staff up post-breach? Or is it simply ensuring that you have the appropriate partnerships to be able to provide just-in-time scale to address it when it would happen, a breach that is? It could be both or a mixture of the two, right? And that is where conscious planning at the highest level of the organization comes in because as a as a CXO, as an executive team, you are really looking at alternative models of cost and pain. Right? Either you either you consciously choose to you know choose to uh, pad up more costs because you are adding redund redundancies and capacity that you may never need. Right? Because that facility is critically important to your critical path of assembly line. They make something that is so critical that you want to keep it running as much as you can. Or you can, if it's not a site that makes a very critical path, you may actually agree to a longer recovery time to say that it's fine, you guys take a week to recover. I accept the downtime and it's consequences on our overall supply chain. Um, but that, that's, the that's the cost I'm signing off on. Because when you pad up on costs, it is not just people, right? You have to make redundancies in your network. You may need to make redundancies. You may need to have a redundant identity management system, for example. You may need redundancy in your hardware. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that you need to build. And um, yeah, and those are contingent costs. So you really have to think through what you need, what you want to do and how you want to do it. And that is why this is not a cybersecurity problem by itself. It is a business problem. It is an operations problem. And that is why it needs cooperation, participation, and sign off at the highest levels of the organization for it to be successful. That's definitely something many organizations that haven't traditionally thought about the cybersecurity problem as being absolutely part and parcel to being able to execute on the mission of the organization. I believe ransomware has brought this to the forefront of enterprises where cybersecurity problems historically or somebody else's issue. Yes, the business signed off on the risk, but they don't really know what that means. Because the unique thing that I see in certain industries like manufacturing, when there's a, a true impact to one core process, in this case, let's say, the casting of parts. Cascading effect is, as you said earlier, very significant to all other aspects of the organization. And I've seen it in other companies where they see that as being not applicable to them. And then the ransomware that we've seen in the last, low, let's say, seven years has really woken them up to the reality that it's not that different. 
when you think about it from the way that perhaps a cybersecurity leader in the manufacturing space might look at it. Would you agree with that? No, I agree. And um, historically, some of the regulated industries like financial services, insurance, they have had pretty well-informed regulators. And the regulators drive a top-down regulatory dictate-driven um, uh, regulatory impact driven, driven um, uh, prioritization of initiatives. And, and then it becomes a cost that everyone has to incur. So uh, that, that works better. In manufacturing, that has historically not been the case. And um, therefore, I think that it, it's, it's it, it, participation and adoption has been little slow. But you're right, ransomware and ransomware related incidents have really brought it to the surface. Also, I think, honestly, the quality of boards have become a lot better over the last two to three years. Right? And well informed boards asking deep penetrating questions have triggered more organizations than many people realize. Because it triggers the leadership to think through in areas where they may not have thought before, and um, and, and adopt practices and uh, policies and priorities which they would not have probably done so a um, few years back. So we, we've talked about the downstream and cascading effects of these types of issues in manufacturing. In your experience, whether in manufacturing or from your time leading other large teams, what have you seen the upstream effects, which then becomes a cascading effect depending on your point of view, that have, have not gotten enough attention or are getting attention, but they're getting attention for the wrong reasons? For example, not in a proactive risk modeling perspective, but perhaps from a post-incident standpoint. So let's say you have a business partner upstream that provides a certain widget that is then incorporated into your product and they have an incident. And if we think of like uh, the time during the pandemic, right? At least here in the United States, traditional network providers that are interdependent on things like very specific chips for firewalls or for VPNs, they couldn't get the parts to actually create the product that their customers needed. And that led to a variety of issues for their customers. From an upstream perspective, what have you seen to be completely ineffective in terms of the governance of that or fairly effective or very promising in terms of its effectiveness as it relates to truly reducing the risk to the downstream consumer of that provider services or product? Sean, that's a many layered question. Um, and I mean, as in all, all, all such non trivial question, I think the best answer it depends. Sure. Okay. So, and let me explain why. So, if you are, if your product is largely hardware, right? You produce something that goes into something else, right? I mean, you 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 produce a cylinder that goes inside an engine block and becomes a car sometime. So, then what you are looking at is outage, contractual violations, and but you can work around that. Monetizing that is a lot easier. Now, if you look at scenarios where, let's say, a compromise or an outage has actually impacted the quality of a piece of code that goes into a hardware product that you use. Let's say airbag actuation. Right? Or let's say the ABS system in your car. And you find out that defect post facto. 
you find out you you supply breaking systems and the ABS software to let's say 200,000 cars in US and you find out post facto after five years that oops you know that particular outage caused some corruption and the ABS may not work as it was intended now you are covered by safety regulations product liability and a whole bunch of uh, laws and regulations so what do you do there is no way you can update or fix it right? so we are looking at a significant replacement liability years down the road then in a manufacturing environment now the amount of software that goes into a product is increasing significantly over time so today most average products have a time of magnitude higher larger amount of code in in either as embedded firmware or a supported system that goes into a product and um, you find out let's say your to take the same automotive example that your collision avoidance system which is primarily software with a bit of hardware that is defective right. and now you can potentially remedy that but it is also going to be expensive but at least you you will be you will be doing either an over the air update or a on site update to a piece of code as opposed to changing the whole device right so the economics tend to change so i would say that it 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 it, it depends but um, but uh, what are the governance processes around this it's a good question i would say some of it is technological but a lot of it is again processes right i mean if i am the manufacturer what are my contractual clauses with my customer right if i have a open ended you know in perpetuity liability <laughs> then i'm carrying a lot of contingent liability Absolutely. right so so often the the remedy remains in old fashioned good you know good 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 contracting uh, good liability management good governance rather than a fix that te technology can provide that significant cost when you um look at the ongoing challenges that are facing our space today and you look forward to let's say the next few to five years and we're seeing more and more integrated uh, production pipelines at least in the software development point of view we're seeing some of these changes happening also in manufacturing with the continued rise of contract based manufacturing and new businesses being spun up within existing manufacturers that may or may not leverage the existing infrastructures that uh, they have already built for the obvious cost savings and operational reasons. Looking forward, the risks that may arise that haven't been discussed or explored sufficiently as an industry? Or do you feel that perhaps cybersecurity as a whole has a good understanding of that world and the nuances of securing that? Not at all. I would say that it's an industry that is at its nascent stage and it is still evolving. And we are all discovering the risks as we move along. So we are talking about we are talking about new modern manufacturing right i mean which is comprehensively fully networked um significantly software driven things like additive manufacturing smart manufacturing uh, products that carry a lot of embedded code because the customers demand quote unquote smart features product that support uh, over the air updates or at least periodic updates so we are 
effectively now manufacturing stuff in a fully networked environment and we are manufacturing products that are essentially you know semi intelligent endpoints right a modern car today is an intelligent endpoint if you think of it that way so that this whole construct brings with it a lot of risks from the point of origination of this whole process to the product and even post facto as the product get ro gets rolled out and i i don't think uh, cyber security as an industry or even modern manufacturing as an industry has really come to grips with uh, with with the what exactly the risks are you know quantifying it and building processes and governance to manage it end to end what will make matters more complex is of course the product liability directives and laws that are coming up in different countries the privacy laws the if you look at the eu product liability directive if you look at the ai act right so there are a lot of laws and regulations that are already in force we are manufacturing products in a in a construct that whose risks we will discover in the future and products whose liability we will carry for a fairly long period of time with us right i mean it's it's going to be an interesting world for the next 3 to 4 years i would say uh, did that answer the question john yeah i think that's a that's a great perspective which is ironically continuous improvement is a key component of manufacturing so to see that uh we find ourselves as an industry in a very similar space when it comes to supporting manufacturing businesses uh that that checks out at least from my point of view what have you found to be effective in terms of taking more modern approaches to servicing an enterprise that isn't 100% on the manufacturing side let's say the traditional business operation sides and still having control in that world but also in this other land of the ot world to keep them as connected as necessary to conduct business but also not to the extent of where a failure on one side translates to the other which is you had alluded to this earlier that that's a key design philosophy in terms of those systems what have you found to be effective in that approach and, and i know you briefly touched upon a zero trust as one of those approaches but what else is there we may not be utilizing as much yeah so um, i would say that over the past at least last 12 months nist has come up with great guidance on iot ot security um there's a lot more lot of work that has happened around ot security both within the standard bodies as well as the governance organizations and um, i think if i have to advise an organization today i would say that draw a line in the sand and everything fix i mean whatever you are doing in the future make sure it is designed to be secure as it should be right from your procurement process that make sure that you only procure devices that can be that are delivered secure they are updated they have the capacity to be updated it's part of your contract you can test it you can patch it so on and so forth and you put a whole governance around it for your legacy look at it the way a hacker would look at it that's one of the best advices i got from one of my peers that don't try to solve everything you will never end up solving it so look at it like a hacker and start addressing the big risks and um, build a design that addresses the bigger risks and um, just keep prioritizing it downwards and last but not the least make sure it is you have 
processes that can help you continue to maintain the state of security, continue the patching, right? I mean, if you have a factory in a remote corner of Asia or Europe somewhere, right? I mean, you can't, cybersecurity team can't go and it may not even have an IT team to go and patch. So you are investing in training to keep it patched to maintain state. Nice. You have people who know how to activate the kill switch if it needs to be done, right? You practice it, you train for it, right? And, and when the time comes, people know where and how to recover. And um, I would say this, this would be the probably the most uh, practical approach because again anything to do with legacy tends to be fairly expensive and most hybrid manufacturing companies are in a fairly competitive space money is short and the, there is always a bit of fiscal stress so you want to be practical and make sure you spend your dollars right so I, I, I would say that's, I, I would go about it that way. Now, how to prioritize what needs to be fixed, again, is as much a management and organizational issue as it is a cybersecurity issue. You have to prioritize which factory is more valuable than the other. And you have to prioritize how you address critical intellectual property, your ground jewels, do you want to store them in the factory where they can be easily compromised or do you want to store them somewhere else? How do you, how, how do you address fact IP that you have in the factory? Um, and often based on your industry, if you are a, if you are a process industry at any point of time, 5,000 liters of chemicals are flowing through your pipes, right, in a continuous 24-7 process. For you, factory security will have to be a completely different thing than a discrete manufacturing industry, right, where you, you are producing discrete units in batches. So it, 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 the nuance will vary. There's no one simple solution, but um, draw a line in the sand, put in processes, procedures to make sure your future investments are secure by default. Think like a hacker and start fixing your legacy assets. And again, you know, the zero trust principles play a part. And I mean, at the end of the day, it is about identity. It is about devices which connect and speak to each other. It is about services which thread your end-to-end -end processes like the APIs, the service endpoints, all of that. So, so you, you, you have to think of it holistically. Uh, Suva, I'm very grateful for your time today, for joining us on the show and providing your very in-depth experience, specifically in this very complex market. Uh, thank you very much for the time today. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Sean, for inviting me. Uh, I hope whatever I had to share is of value to you and our listeners. And as always, I'm always available to answer questions and share what I know. You've been listening to the CISO's Gambit. I'm your host, Sean Cordero. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this show, please leave a comment and subscribe. Content on this podcast may contain forward-looking statements that are current as of the date of recording and subject to change. These statements are subject to the safe harbor provisions created by the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. Full legal disclaimers are available at revolutionaries.zscaler.com. Copyright 2022.